Just going to go for it. Do it. From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together, they're raising an ever-growing army of adorkable children and planning the revolution. So, so, yeah. Good week. You know, I've had better. <laughs> we missed a podcast. Yeah. Because we were just so wiped, wiped out, out and overloaded last weekend. <laughs> yeah. And this weekend, I had a bad allergy attack, just like wiped oh. out by hay fever and, you know. All that stuff. Yeah. And so I've had to dope myself up with massive amounts of antihistamines again. It kind of yeah. hit me by surprise and just like set oh, off. Oh, Set off, yeah. yeah. So I've been feeling terrible. But I got, I cleaned the oven. Yay! <laughs> and, I uh, had a few days where I was really just whacked. Yeah. Like I'd, I'd basically eaten some things off the, off plan. Off, off your, your healthy food list. Yeah, and it really kicked my ass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was miserable for like a couple of days I just had to like, you know guys? I'm not available. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, to the kids, you mean. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just go uh, go raise yourselves. Go raise yourselves. <laughs> go play amongst yourselves. Yeah. yeah. Fortunately, with like a large lot and woods and the, the, and the can, older kids and the younger kids, they can safely they, play They actually themselves. can right. do that. They can right. go play in the woods and do sword fights and whatever. And, yeah. And come to me as needed. Yeah. So, so. so that was, I, I was glad to have that. And yeah, and then this escape hatch. This week I had like a really productive work week, but everything else feels like hell. Yeah, it just isn't moving and doing anything. We're still in this. Uh, still in Saginaw hell with the goddamn hell. <laughs> we're Jesus. we're still going through this process of trying to figure out what's the the best worst option, the least yeah. worst option, the least worst. Yeah, and the house, the, none house, of the solutions are good. No, no, I mean none of them are gonna. No, it's it's you know, I think we've we've talked about this, but it's we're no, we can't we're not even hoping to get back what we put into the house. <laughs> no, and, not by a long shot. You know, and that would be like the normal thing that was sort sure. of supposed to happen, mm. and then we're not even hoping to like get out of it what we currently owe no no which would still require us to pay like for this the commissions and and selling fees and whatnot yeah at this point we're trying to figure out how much we can like afford to lose afford to lose to sell it yes how much debt can we take on to sell the house more debt right right so, like, what size of a loan can I take just to be able to bring enough cash to closing to, close to get this house. thing off our backs? Yeah. And it's not good. That's no, not pretty. Um, we're also considering possibly leasing the house. And like a lease with a purchase option. But I would still have to borrow six or $7,000 because I want us to put... A furnace, two furnaces. Yeah, to replace the furnaces. So yeah, this house is so big it has two furnaces. Yeah, and we tried to get an estimate for combining the furnaces into one, and and they just tell us you can't even do it. Like you, like you're talking about a commercial system. You would need to buy a a furnace that's that's made for like an office building or something, and it would be very very expensive to run. To run and to retool, right? Yeah, and the. uh, the house isn't designed for that kind of ducting, so you have to redo the duct. It, work it will be super inefficient. Inefficient because it's not tight like a modern office building. Precisely, and actually, this is this last estimate was the first time someone explained it. Like to walked you. me through, like, so why is this a bad option? Right, we've we've talked to pe- try to talk to people about it before, and they just like, like oh, yeah, no, 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 I'm not gonna. But no, that. this this guy you had out actually like laid it out for you. Out why? It, no, this is not, why this it's not going to work. Right. I mean, you could do this. It would cost you fifteen thousand dollars, and you could do this, but it would and be even more expensive. The to monthly run the bill heat would be even higher than running two conventional house furnaces. Right. Right. So, so there it is. So what we really are Looking wanting at. to do is replace both furnaces. Yeah, because one of them 
technically still runs. And actually has not set off the carbon monoxide detectors even once. Well, yes. But it's uh but it's it's really it's this old elderly, and it's really damaged. It's a 40-year-old furnace. Right. I think yeah. it was installed in 1978. Something like that. Yeah. And it you know, it still runs. The previous and, one. There are two. That's weird. So there's thing. two, right. In the crawl space there's an old dead one and then there's the from current like 1960. one. From like 1960. Yeah. <laughs> there's the one yeah. from 1978. Yeah. And which seems to have lasted about 40 years. Right. And that's way beyond the, <laughs> way the beyond shelf the, life. The shelf life, right. I mean, it's like an extra 20 years of right. service. Right. So what we're wanting to do is actually put a third furnace in there. Right. And, have, and part of what the quote was for the reason it's more expensive remove the old is to ones. remove the, old two, the two old furnaces, put yeah. a new one in, and then the newer furnace in the larger space, which... We can get a more efficient one. We can get an even more efficient one. We can get more efficient ones of both, actually. Yeah. Um, and that, that actually might result in lower energy bills together with the no attic, insulation. attic rework. But we don't really know we because really know. we haven't got take try to take the house through a winter with these changes in it right. yet. And then, um, yeah, and this is an ongoing unresolved issue because the insurance company can go to hell. The, um, they still owe us money. They still and owe us money, and the company that cleaned the ducts didn't. Yeah, that was yeah. exciting to find out. We thought like, really? they had done it, and they called us and said, "Oops." Well, no, they remember they called you because the guy was like at the property. We wanted to try and get back in, and we changed the lockbox. A lock box. month after we thought yeah, this work like had been two done. Months. Like two, two months. months. After we thought two it was months done. after yeah, yeah. we thought this was all done and we paid for it. It was kind of appalling. To be honest, uh, yeah. and we're like okay, and you know we could stomp our feet and shake our fists and like say get our and you shout know, out attorney to the clouds. and shout out to the clouds. yeah shout out clouds or like threaten them to we could we could like tell our credit card company to reverse that charge or we could get our attorney to call them or something. Some- I don't even know. But, what. um, but what's what the, what but the there's no the point. point. We just yeah. want to get the damn work we done. We just want the work done. And it's been an ongoing problem, an ongoing thing. Oh, but I wasn't done with the insurance I'm company. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Because they still owe us money. They still owe us $1,700 yeah. or so. And, and we're, we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel to, tr- to pay off the guys who did the paint and plaster work because we were counting on getting this reimbursement. Right. So they've and been they were very, turning around re- so fast before. Right. Yeah. So they've been very patient because. They haven't come after us, but like right, no. they've allowed us to pay over a period of a few months because you know they're getting paid. They're getting paid. They but, know us. But they know we're good for it eventually. But it's yeah. leaving our accounts dangerously low. To it's not easy to come up with an extra thirty five hundred dollars over the last you know over these the few blue. months. Right. Yeah, that wasn't budgeted for. Right. I mean, because I think we'd only budget it for our deductibles. Right. 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 So. Um, and. There's this ongoing thing. I think I've mentioned it before with the furnace. Yeah. Where their claim is that oh the, the bat the bats didn't burn it out didn't right. con- didn't cause it to overheat and it's crack a thirteen the year old furnace. It's a thirteen year old furnace. And their claim was oh it's just end of life. It's just the end of its life, and they said the yeah. clogged filter may have contributed right. to it. Right. And I'm thinking, dude. If you know you, what the filter was clogged with. If you looked in the furnace, you saw a dead bat, at least one. Yes, in, clogging, in the, clogging filter. the filter, like stuck in there. So and if you think I, the filter, I believe clogged, that slowed down the airflow enough to cause the heat exchanger to overheat and crack. Right, because but, you, you know, know who am I? Who you, and what do we, what do we know? Um, anyway, but yeah, uh, the, the filter was dirty, right? I right. Mean, <laughs> well, and it was also full of bats. And full of <laughs> <laughs> just dirty and full of bats. Right. So I'm just saying. So their 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 claim is that well this wasn't related to the bats. So that's not their responsibility. So they don't want to cover the furnace. So like okay, so, so yeah, fine. Thank can you. we So basically it's like any money we're considering putting into the house it's just gone. We we know and and have put in for these repairs. We know we're not going to see any of it back. Right. We're just trying to see okay, if putting this money in will somehow allow us to, to move on to that next least bad option right. somehow. Allow us to get rid of the house. Right. Right. Either to sell it or lease it and kick the can. And leasing it is just going to kick, kick the, the can, can down, down the road. Because you still have to go through this process of somehow yeah. selling it. In three years. Five, or, three to five years. Yeah. Right. 
being on length of the least. And that's like best case. And, you yeah. know, the least could also go bad, you know, someone yeah, that could, could go bad. Yeah. Someone could fail to make mortgage make payments, and then we're kind of we're on the hook, screwed all over again. Anyway, it's well, all fun. It's all fun. So that's been like I don't know, weighing on us this week because really, we have to make a decision soon. Yeah, what we're, how we're going to get the house through the winter? Right. Yeah, and that that so it is coming to to a a deadline kind of, yeah. which is really like the first hard freeze, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and and I think. I think we have to figure out a solution by October well before 1st. then. Right, we have to have something in mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think by October first. Yeah, really. Yeah. Um, and then you know we can't even like, we're not ready to 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 heat this house. We're still running our AC around the clock. Oh my god! Yeah. Because the yeah. heat is really lingering. This really lingering this, this year. Yeah. And um. We also, uh, our heating system was leaking water all over the floor of the... Yeah, we need to have somebody look at that. So somebody has to come. So it's it needs to be like, I think we need, need to have a couple of valves replaced or repacked or whatever they Something do with like these that. What do they do faucets. with boilers? And then we have to have the thing like flushed and refilled with fresh right. water right. and tested. Yeah. And that's not in the budget because we're paying all these thousands of dollars for, for the, the old house. for the paint and plaster repair. And and did all the like like miscellany yeah. related to yeah. the old house. And there's just there's just a lot of miscellany. Right. That wasn't And we had to pay budget. for that because we exceeded our our insurance coverage. Yes. Right. Yeah, the mold was beyond their 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 the coverage. Water and mold damage. Right. Is, Which I'm like how much would more water and mold coverage cost? Because right. maybe we want it. You know? <laughs> well, I don't think we can pay for it retroactively. <laughs> oh, well, no, no. But like yeah, right. going on forward. On this house. On yeah. this house and going yeah. forward. Maybe we want that coverage. And maybe, <sighs> you know, how much? I mean, really, what are we talking? Yeah. But I don't think we want it from them. No. We would like uh, to change insurance companies Which it really, when we're all done with this. Yeah. Like, we, we want to put all this to bed first. But yeah. Um, it's a real disappointment because I was happy to buy from a mutual. You know what I mean? Right, right. But no, they've they've been very hard to work with, and we've yeah. been very unsatisfied with. And the one claim that was working is now gone south. So, uh, yeah, here we are. So we've also been following um, Hurricane Florence with some trepidation. Yeah, I have a lot of friends. You got some family down there? You've got friends. I've got family. Uh, my aunt and uncle live in Myrtle Beach. I mean, they're my family too, but you know what I'm saying. Yes. Right. Um, and But fortunately, I heard from um, my cousin. cousin, their oldest daughter, mm-hmm. who took them uh, to D.C., which is his own kind of suffering, but well, <laughs> but you know, but they're out of the they're out of the, the the people are out of the path of the storm, which is good. Their house, we really don't know, but I mean, I I it's anybody's guess with the house. I don't know if their whole they're about seven miles from from the Atlantic in it's Myrtle Beach. Far. It's, it's not, not very far. far, and they have a small inland like creek running through their development through their mm-hmm. through their yard. And I think I I know that in past storms the water has come up to within a few feet of their front door. Yeah. Um, so I've got to assume that their house is probably flooded. I doubt if because Myrtle Beach wasn't on the highest wind mm-hmm. zone. I don't think that you know probably it did a lot of wind damage to their home. Oh, maybe. But my guess is that it's probably flooded. Probably. And well, certainly, I know, I've seen pictures from Fort Mill, which is further inland. Yeah. And they've had they've had a lot of down trees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's true. They could have trees down too. Mm-hmm. But and and I also know that like power was out for that whole region. So I mean, right. if they had stayed, I think they would have been looking at trying to survive like at least a week and probably more with no power power. in a zone where you, they can't travel around. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so we're watching that situation and unfortunately, and quite a few people have been killed already. Um, and I got into a, a A snit on Twitter with a Pennsylvania representative, a guy who was talking about basically how these, 
reports of how this was such a dangerous storm were were fake news because oh look it's already news, only a category news. one hmm. we're like dude dude, dude. <laughs> people's lives are at risk okay? people's lives are at risk and the category actually only amounts to describing the wind speed the wind speed right right and you know some of the most devastating storms in recent memory were category either one category two. one or had all, had degenerated into a tropical, tropical storm, storm wind right. by the time they did most of their I think damage. Sandy was a, wasn't Sandy a category yes, one? A one. Yeah. It like yeah. went from a two to a one. And then and Harvey, which flooded Texas with like fifty inches of rain, which yeah. is just an unfathomable amount of rain, like trillions of gallons of of rain. You know, was a tropical storm when it did that. 50 inches. So that's like yeah, four feet of water. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of water. It's a lot of water. Yeah, I'm not sure it's trillions, but I think it's billions. It's, I, if well, okay. You're gonna, you're gonna go for trillions? I, you know, I remember reading up on, the, like, trying to calculate the volume of water involved. Mm -hmm. And it was... Staggering. It was a number that you couldn't just, just couldn't wrap your head around. Right, it was a staggering amount. Yeah. Right. So... It's enough to yeah. change the the um, it's enough water to change the geography, like to to change the pressure on the the um, uh, continental plates, and oh, cause yeah. like geographic changes causes geographic changes causes land to rise and fall, cause like volcanoes to happen on the other side of the world. You know, like. Good grief almighty. It's just staggering. A staggering amount of water. Yeah, and it changes, actually, it changes the, the rotation of the earth a little bit to redistribute slightly. that, much, that water. much water. Yeah, so you know, I, I really feel like the climate change things is a, um, <clears throat> we don't really know what we're, we've gotten into. We, no, of course not. Like, we don't, we don't fully understand what we've gotten into. Well, and, and here's the thing I was about to say about Sandy. Yeah. Um. New Jersey is still recovering from Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, sure. Which was a Category One, and there's—I mean, there are places right. that are still sure. in shambles. Sure. How many years ago was that? Yeah. You know. So, so it, it's a Category One hurricane is not a trivial thing. No, and these and the sort of the modern risk has been that these storms that don't have such huge winds, because of this climate amplification, they're mm -hmm. carrying far more water. Water and heat. And yeah. heat. And they're far w bigger, like wider, right. cover a larger area than... Right. This is multi-state. This is like South Carolina, the, Car the Carolinas and Virginia. Yeah it, yeah. it sort of depends on how you define the boundaries of the, of the, the storm. storm. The storm yeah. itself, like the eye of it, was not that It didn't cover three huge. states. No, no, it's a couple miles across, but right. but um, it's passed along uh, the coast and it was moving that's another part of the problem if the system is dropping all this rain mm -hmm. and it's moving extremely slowly like oh, and it yeah. was like six miles an hour or something it's moving right. really slowly it has system. days days, days to, to, to to drop amazing amounts of rain and it's moving it was moving sort of southwest and now it's sort of turned a little west and it's going further inland Mm -hmm. And eventually it'll blow through Michigan, you know, what's left of yeah, it. Yeah, what's left of right? it. But, um, or, or, you know, maybe further east. I don't know. It's hard to predict that far out. Mm -hmm. But um, the the system is baffling me a little bit because it's pulling in these rain bands behind it. And right. it's like, you expect that once it's over land, the... Um, we lose some steam. Basically, the, it's like a fire. Right. Right. It's sort of a chemical... It's a physical process, sort of analogous to a chemical process, where you have energy transferred. Mm -hmm. And over the ocean, the warm ocean, you have this energy transfer happening. It basically is a a process that um, sucks. Energy. Yeah, sucks heat. Right, so it sucks redistributes heat. heat from the ocean through this vortex that right. happens. Right. Once it is over land, you would expect that it would slow down. Slow that down it and would, cool down. It would dissipate mm -hmm. but it's, well, it does slow down yeah but they with due to friction with like right but that that i don't see them dissipate it doesn't they have to burn it it has to burn itself out yeah but 
Yeah, because the the land shouldn't be giving off as much you know warm wet air as the ocean, ocean was. was but, ideally, but yeah, it's, it's we. So we're the the meteorologists who I've been reading who are talking about this said the scale of this and like the behavior of it moving this slowly uh, is some is kind of unprecedented, you know, mm -hmm. and. So they're saying, yeah, it's going to come ashore as a Category 2 and weaken rapidly, mm -hmm. but, but this is going to drop record amounts of rain. rain. And I, I thought I heard it described as seven months of rain in three days. Yeah, something like something that. Something like that, or, you know, a year's worth of rain. Yeah. It's Far more rain than, than, the, than the, any infrastructure is built for. Right. Than, than the land can handle, that can absolutely. run off safely. So... So are we having hundred year storms every year now? It is a hundred year storm. Uh, it's not every year, but it's it's but getting there years. every yeah. few years. We have another hundred year storm. Yeah, no, it's kind of absurd. It is absurd, and f I was so angry at this guy because for him to be constant, keep blah, downplaying blah, blah. the severity of it, based entirely on the category, mm -hmm. like dude, you you should resign your your position. You're a hazard to your constituents and anyone who might trust you as a, a an authority figure this yeah. is you know you're, you're this kind of rhetoric gets people killed yeah although this is the thing i was trying to say about the the fake news gambit right yeah and the untrustworthy media yeah uh, we've been saying on the left for a very long time now mm -hmm. that the media is not trustworthy right right i mean so it's really hard to push back against someone using that framing, right? And you know, right? you know, as I'm saying this, there's a there's a video clip circulating online. Oh God, yes. Of a weatherman standing like in a what's that coat called? Like a, uh, a windbreaker. Like a windbreaker. Like he's leaning and rocking and like like trying to make trying to make it look as dramatic as, as possible, possible right. as if he's literally having a hard time staying standing s standing right. in you know what really at the time we're only like 35 mile wow, hour winds, winds. right and, and behind him he's trying he's literally trying to make it look as dramatic as possible right and then from a different camera angle camera angle behind him a couple of guys in shorts are sort of nonchalantly strolling. strolling through a parking lot to their car, and I invented some dialogue for them. It's like, so you want to go see if the Waffle House is open? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> I mean, they're just, it's, there's nothing going right. on. And they're right? not, they're, I mean, yeah, it's windy. It's windy. Uh, you can see their coats right. flapping in the wind. Yeah, it's windy. But, but it's, they're literally strolling. And the other thing you notice is that the guy's leaning into the wind. If you look at the grass and the plants and the trees and whatnot, yes. he's leaning the wrong Away. way. <laughs> The wind's blowing the other way, bro. Like, yeah. So, so yeah, we should trust the, the media, media and the the news, right? right? We should trust the Weather Channel yeah. to tell us what's, what's happening. happening. Well, yeah. Yeah, uh, yes so and no. Yes I mean, no. trust. You, pick your favorite meteorologist and maybe trust that person, but don't I trust guess. the hype. And, well, no, that's and I think that's why it's hard to push back against this guy yeah. in Pennsylvania. Yeah, is because with that frame. Right. In the context of reality. Right. He's got a point. Like what he are these does people have are... a point. Right. But, but it's still, you can't tell people, no, this storm is not dangerous. And not calling dangerous, it dangerous deal. is fake news. That's that's where it pushes crosses the line. <sighs> but there is this real thing. Yeah. And that's the way you kind of like lob these things out there into the, into the zeitgeist and yeah. get sort of like energy moving around these ideas. Yeah. You have to start with the kernel of truth. Right. And the kernel of truth is that the media is not trustworthy and hasn't no, been for a long time. No. And they're and even if they're not literally telling lies like this weatherman, right? right <laughs> like right. this correspondent. Um they're you know, certainly they're exaggerating everything they're from exaggerating, ratings, and that's, they're, and that's they're just skewing. how it's done. And that was my big thing with the um that uh was op ed or the editorial, the anonymous editorial. Yeah. This was the New York Times actually creating news. Yes. Yeah. They're supposed to report the news. Yes. They're not supposed to generate the news. No, this was a real, I mean, you know, the news cycle is so hypercharged recently that yeah. this is already kind of out of the news cycle a little bit. Right. But I don't but want to forget this. This media frenzy and this, I'm with the resistance working inside the Trump administration, you know. 
It's like, who exactly is trolling who and for what ends? Right. And it really, everyone's worried about the content and who this guy is and and what it represents and Ugh. all this meta stuff. Yeah, everyone... No, really, uh, the problem is that the New York Times would print this. Everyone is arg- was on like 1A on the, the NPR morning show was, was arguing about their favorite theory of who is, is this, this mysterious, mysterious resistance figure? Like, oh, fuck. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> like, yeah. fuck everything about this, honestly. No, really, really. And so this is the New York Times making a, an editorial decision... To make news. To make news. Yeah. And that is not their job. Right. And that's a fundamental violation of their journalistic integrity. And, you know, I I guess it's... I can see uh, legitimate cases for them running an op-ed from a person who's in a sensitive position, um, like a dissident or something, you know, in Burma or in wherever, in Venezuela. Or, so, you know, I'm not going to say there's never Maybe. a case to be made for an anonymous op-ed. But um, I am going to say, that, yeah, I'm going to say this This wasn't it. This wasn't right? it. Well, no, here's the thing. The dissident in Burma yeah. talks to a journalist who writes a story right? and says, I cannot reveal the names of my, of my sources. sources. Yeah. My, my source and my sources right. for these reasons. It's not really and an op-ed. Yeah. It's not really an op-ed. Yeah. It doesn't go in that context. Right. That's not the part of the paper where it belongs. And so right. a journalist can and, do that. And there's a context for that. Yeah. There's a place for that. And so what is this, this you know, deep throat within the Trump administration? Please. What is this person risking? Because right? when they write an op-ed, there's no mediator, as in a journalist, who says, I've verified some this of the story, facts. some of the facts of this right. story. Right. So this op-ed writer can just make it up. Right. And then they just print it, and then they cash in. Right. That's not journalism that's making that's creating and manufacturing yeah news. this all uh, this happened like just a day or two after or in the same week i think as uh this like new yorker festival of ideas or that where they were uh, they uh were gonna have steve bannon on stage debating <sighs> you know yeah and it's i really that what got, happened to no platform that got a lot of push it actually a lot of that argument took place on Twitter, yeah. and uh, it was interesting to watch it hash out because they did back down. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, but really, I'm pretty firm about a no, no platform for fascists. You but know? the idea that like, oh, he has interesting things today. Let's def- defeat him in the marketplace of ideas. You know, <laughs> I mean, first of all, he's no longer at the time when this was happening. He's been out of the public eye he he he's doesn't have he's not a thing anymore he doesn't have right. a position in the administration he doesn't you know I mean, he doesn't really, have anything interesting to bring to the table and, right and that's been amply demonstrated precisely and he only has something interesting to bring if we give it to him if we give it to him and his and you know this is just basically an opportunity to rehabilitate his career as a as a bomb thrower you know right and, and there's there's no reason for us to do that there's no reason for us to do that there's no sense in which he could be considered to have such somehow sterling intellectual qualifications no. or such radical interesting ideas that there's really a uh, an important case that we need to hear right. from him. No, he's setting up some kind of alt right thing um, in Italy, in Rome, yeah, near the Vatican, and what right. right. So, I, I think there's this sort of, um, you know, these folks at think tanks are kind of dangerous. Yes, or at least they can be. Yeah, and I think he's in that space, and I think the less um, uh, traffic his ideas get, right, that that really just kind of eliminates that danger right. from him right. is to stop trafficking in his ideas right. because he's not in a position to do anything except influence people with his ideas yes so uh and you know the fact that the new yorker won't give him a us time on stage and some kind of big public program yeah that's not censorship that's not censor- no no that's not a first amendment issue i mean they won't give me time on the stage right <laughs> So, Lord knows I've tried. Right, so you know he I'm just can saying. he can publish a stupid Google blog the same way that I do all the time, all he wants. You know, and he's got followers; they'll probably pass it around amongst themselves. Yeah, 
And I've noticed this is this is a thing, and it's been a thing for a while, right? And it's a trick. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, he can have a YouTube. Well, they might throw him off. They throw him off YouTube. YouTube but no, this is a trick. This is the trick. Right. So, I had literally never heard of Eminem. I'd never heard of him. I didn't until know until when. Well, until there was this big flap where Elton John was going to perform with him. Oh. Oh. Right. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, then, well, that that so he's. That was 20 years ago. That was 20 years ago. Right. Or, but he was a big name then. Yeah. Like everyone had heard of him. I had heard I, of him. Because I knew his music, and I, I, I have three m uh, m CDs. Right? So, you know, you'd, yeah. you'd heard of him, you knew who he was, etc. Yeah. I'd never heard of him, yeah. right? Um, Like at all. Yeah. I, and then I'd he was going to perform not, with... I don't, and I don't and then unquestioningly support him. He's... he's kind of a disturbing character oh yeah but he had some really cool music well, he had some good so. music and, and you know he's a white guy that's performed in the detroit music scene right for his entire career right somehow he's never managed to use the n-word i don't know what that's about yeah it's like a gift or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but um that aside so he's gonna do this thing with elton john and it's an outrage because he's some kind of a homophobe he right? is a homophobe yeah and and, so, and he's a misogynist you know right and so oh my god Elton John's going to perform with him. I got three emails about this guy (laughs) from people I know. Because we were teaching the controversy. Right, right. (laughs) So suddenly, this person I've never heard of, Yeah. now I know about him, I'm like, so maybe I should listen to his music and figure out what's going on. I think he... Right? I think if he's a best-selling artist, he should be a uh, performer of the Grammys, you know, like... So, you know, but that's another question for the time. But no, here's the trick. Yeah. You engage in controversy. Right. So that people that have not heard about you Mm -hmm. hear about you. Right. Because people will talk about the controversy, whatever the controversy is, with people who are concerned about the con or you expect to be concerned about the controversy. Right. Yeah. So that's actually a specific strategy. Yes. So. True. Yeah, if your publicist you, will work that out for we'll you. Will work that strategy yeah. out. So if you want a story about Steve Bannon in front of eyeballs on my page, yes, right? Steve Bannon does something controversial and troubling that's going to own the libs or whatever yeah. your framing is, right? Sure. And then all my friends freak out and share it with me. Right. And this was happening 20 years ago before any social media. This was a thing. This is a way... To move your message, right? right? To people who right. haven't seen it. So his goal is to get it in front of receptive eyeballs yeah. that maybe haven't looked in his corner of the world before. Right. Uh, and he finds that by finding my page and people who know me and people who have looked at him or know about him and be like, hell no. Um, you have to move your message in front of those people. You're talking about Bannon. Bannon. Or it, this is anybody right. who wants to advance their idea. So it's... So during the election, and in, even now, mm-hmm. a lot of this stuff that's like, oh my God, did you know that Steve Bannon's doing this right, thing? Right, right. There are an awful lot of people who just retweet, well, you know, I, I say that, I retweet a lot of stuff. The but, oh my God, right? But the I don't, I don't usually have a oh my God reaction, and I try, I try not to share things that are just hype. Right. But I try to share interesting well, bits. And, but the, and all those things are, oh, the horror. Yeah, oh, the horror. Well, the, and, and then talking about them, too. And then right, and talking about it, right? So and, the only function that serves yeah. is that anybody on my feed that maybe didn't know that Steve right. Bannon was doing this, right. now they know, and maybe they're interested. Right. No, these these things, like, the, uh, like this op-ed and like mm-hmm. the Bannon thing, Really, the best way to think about them, as far as I'm concerned, is that they are literally psyops. Literally. Yeah. It's literally a psyop. Yeah. And so that's why I you know, I share all kinds of things. I share lots of things. And the point yeah. of it is for discussion and whatnot. Right. But um, I prefer to share things from uh, not from mass media per se. Right. Major media outlets. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I still do share. I right. share things to the Times and so on, but I'm very selective about it for that reason. I tend to, because it's uh, function. On Twitter, I tend to share yeah. things from individuals who are yes. writing like yes, who are writing using Twitter as a platform. Generally, individuals aren't sophisticated enough to run a psyop or connected enough to run a psyop. Mm-hmm. They may want to, 
But they, they just aren't sophisticated. Well, I keep or trying. Enough. I keep trying to start a cult. I, yeah, it hasn't taken off yet. Yeah. So, anyway, that's what's happening, and that's the trick. And it's a very, it's a very basic trick. Yeah. Right. And then suddenly you're like horrified by this horrible thing that Steve Bannon is doing, and I have to tell everybody, and you know, blah blah blah. Now they all know, and they're gonna tell all their friends. And in that circle, there's maybe one person, but he knows other people. Mm-hmm. It's like you know what I know exactly the five people that would be interested in this, and right. that's all they're looking for. That's the whole point right. of this and is to gather those people into one place. And this is really this is actually how fascist ideas are spread. Precisely and, how they're spread, and how they recruit and um, get, start to gain, start to get people get sympathetic to a, their and develop sympathy, right? Yeah. So. And so, yeah. So that's really, why it's so, this, this no is, platforming is critical. And this is we talked about this uh, reading Antifa and yeah. the everyday Antifa, mm-hmm. um, everyday anti-fascism techniques right. and whatnot. So, so you, know. you really should think hard when you're sharing things on social media. Am I just spreading? Am I doing controversy st- right. for for a fascist? Right. Am I you know, just to, I'm having, doing advertising for a fascist? Yeah. You yeah. might be. You really might be. Right. And that's how it, a lot of liberals end up functioning with all yes. their rage right. treating, tweeting and rage posting about the horrible yeah. things the administration's doing. I, and it now it's and all the stuff about the the Russian the, oh, oh my God. I really can't see it as anything but a but a psyop now. Yes, yeah. And I don't share I would just like credit for calling it very early. <laughs> I just want credit for that, that's all. Because yeah, there just is Still, and you know, I'm I'm pleased. Like I follow the the Mueller investigation, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm pleased that Manafort is like negotiated, like pleaded guilty, or all the all these things. I'm pleased with these things that some people are going to jail, some people are being fined and whatnot. But I just don't see. Uh, it's kind of a big so what. I it's 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 a nice thing. It does sort of indirectly discredit this administration chip by chip, but it's mm-hmm. not. It's not setting up any kind of overturning or, or prosecution of anyone that, that really matters. I got a quibble. I got a quibble with that, though. Yeah. That presupposes that this administration had any credibility to begin with. Well, okay. <laughs> yes. I mean, like, seriously, but, we need to discredit it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's true. Because, because you know, like the fact that, that Reagan's administration had more convicted uh, criminals in it than any other administration in history. It was like, what was the final tally? Like 230 30, or like something like that. Of criminals, right? Yeah, people actually convicted of, of, felonies. of felonies doesn't change people's opinion of the those no. golden glory days of Reagan no. and uh, you know, the, the Gipper, the noble Gippers a uh, lot stride of the land like a converts. colossus. <laughs> so there's the Dem faithful yes. and the Republican converts and the re- resistance, right? Yes. The Republican converts still speak fondly of Reagan. Sure. Well, and now they're glowingly fondly, and they're rehabilitating Bush and all that. And I don't, yeah. I don't doubt that at some point in in the near future, history books will be literally printing Trump's propaganda and saying Trump's inauguration was the biggest, biggest inauguration. attended inauguration in American <laughs> history, and they will be just uncritically echoing those things and they will have made him squeaky clean but yeah. the record will be there and if yeah, you, you look at the wikipedia yeah. page and read it you'll be saying wow an awful lot of people were convicted of money laundering and, and crimes failing to register as a foreign agent and all this but right. there's such a there's there's a, actually a real simple um explanation for an awful lot of this which really which I've I've talked about before, which is basically, um, as Trump's campaign got underway, mm-hmm. he just reached into his network. Oh yeah, and his network is full of petty criminals and and you know, quasi traitorous oh, yeah. you know, people who you know fixers and whatnot. Right, and they all like, hey, here's an opportunity to make some money. Okay, and, and here's the the twist to it. Right. None of them thought he would win. Precisely. <laughs> and so they're like, "Yeah, so, let's just grift as much as we can out of this shit." You know, we'll yeah. just 
we'll, we'll learn as much as we can. We'll we'll run as many scams as we can on it. And you know, since he's going to lose, no one will be looking at the books that closely. Right. Don't get me right. Thing. Right. And it was a shock to Trump, and it was a shock to all these campaign people mm-hmm. that he won. Well, I. Yes, I think it was. I will say this, however, because of the nature of his win. Yes. Someone was clearly... Right, playing the electrical... Co- electrical. <laughs> the electrical college. <laughs> playing the electoral college. But, knew, but what, someone, knew what they were... Had a strategy right. there. Someone had a clear, yeah. rational yeah. strategy for yeah. winning. I don't know who that was. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it was... I don't think it was 45 himself. But no. someone... Yeah. Pulling strings, right? Had a clear, rational strategy in a way that they clearly didn't with Clinton's <laughs> campaign. Right? Have, like a clear, rational. But a lot of the a lot of the big grift and whatnot mm-hmm. that went on with these, you know, campaign associates and whatnot uh, ha- happened early on, right? And so they really were unconvinced back then. Oh that, yeah, that, like yeah, that, like in what Trump 20, was going like to win. Twenty fifteen, right? Like so they were like, yeah. we can just do oh, whatever the good. hell we want. Do, we'll do just, what you like. You know, because this is going to all sink like a stone from the public eye. Okay. You then, know. you know, no one's going to be interested or care. It. Stone. Roger Stone. Anyways. Oh. So, anyway. yeah. Okay. Where are we? Where are we? That's a good question. So, um, we've finished our introduction here, our int- introductory remarks, remarks. Now let's get on to the uh, Let's get on to the, the meat topic. of the show. Yeah. So, we don't, the meat of the show this week is we don't really have a lot of meat, and we didn't prepare reading articles or whatnot. Well, this is a vegetarian episode? Yeah, this is a vegetarian okay. episode. Actually, we just had a vegetarian dinner. That was so good. Your friend had an open house, and uh, she had a ton of food left over. Yes. And you were there, and she said, take some of this food, please. please. <laughs> don't leave without food. And Please. so you brought home like a tray of fatouche salad and mishatra and um and some just fresh cut melon some melon and it yeah. was a terrific light oh, it was a meal. Great meal yeah a great summer meal for a hot day right mm-hmm. so we're very satisfied with that yeah um but we don't really have a topic as far as no. a political topic tonight no we, no we don't we're catching up a little bit on current events but I also said why don't we just catch up on some of the media stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this is mostly me. It's mostly stuff from my blog. It's this thing that I do because mm-hmm. you're not reading a lot of fiction. or. No, I'm not reading a terrible lot. I'm I'm right. basically, you know what I'm reading? I'm reading recipe books to plan Thanksgiving dinner. That's Already? what I'm reading. Yep. Now? Yep. Good for you. Hey, you know. Yeah, well, we're growing scout. some pumpkins, yep. right? Growing some pumpkins. I was a Girl Scout. <laughs> I try to think ahead. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff I've been reading and watching, mm-hmm. and um, you won't have a huge amount to say, but feel free no, to jump no, in I'll, if you have. I'll any. jump in as needed. You know, I'll be. I'll make uh, obnoxious remarks as yeah, as the so, moment calls for it. So I picked up earlier in the year. I bought a set of seven uh, books by Michael Moorcock. They mm-hmm. that basically represent the whole. Uh, all the Elric stories. Right. And this is his most famous uh, character. Oh, yeah. We, we've talked a bit about these books before. Yeah. yeah. We introduced him before. Um, I have finished the first six. Wow. Yeah. You've they're working. not yeah. They're not really that long. They're not long and dense. They're, yeah. they're padded. So the padded, they're like, most of them are like there's a novel which is really a fix up which is padded out with a few extra stories and an intro and an outro essays. Mm-hmm. So they're not weren't really that long but the books are Elric Stormbringer, Elric the Sailor on the Seas of Fate, Elric the Sleeping Sorceress and other stories, Elric the Revenge of the Rose, Elric of Melnibone and other stories, Elric the Fortress of the Pearl. And these editions are their British editions, Golanx, mm-hmm. um, and they they're nice, colorful books. They're well made paperbacks. Yeah. Um, they look nice on the shelf. In this set, Moorcock rearranged all the Elric material in internal chronological order, like story oh, order. In story order, like this is the first thing that happened in the story. Right. It's not there. Oh, right. Yeah. So you talked about this before about how the, it's not in release date order. Right. And how you just basically decided to go back and read it in release date order. Yeah. 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 I I went, I read this stuff 
and decided that it's not actually fun to try and read it in story chronology. No, his his more exciting stuff was first written first. Yeah, so I'll talk although about I think that. you opened up something else though about like the order. Yeah, like there's a good chunk first, and then there's another good chunk. Yeah, later. Yeah, right. I'll mention that. But so I actually would recommend that if you want to get into the Elric stuff, start like this. Read it. Read these things in in uh, publication order. Right. And this is his stories go back to 1962, I think. They they were like it's been a while, right? Yeah, it's been a while. And he was very young when he published some of these like I think he was 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. Um The Dreaming City, a novelette, the novelette or novella, While the Gods Laugh, The Stealer of Souls, Kings in Darkness. These are all short works. The Caravan or Forgotten Dreams, a.k.a. The Flamebringers. Mm -hmm. And then Stormbringer, which is a novel, but it's also a fix-up, so it's also put together out of several novellas. Mm -hmm. And then that basically is the end of the Elric story. And spoiler, you know, he dies at the end of that arc. Oh, yeah. Right. At the end of Stormbringer. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a few more stories that I would highly recommend reading after that. One is called The Singing Citadel, and then one called The Eternal Champion, which is a great novel, novella. Mm -hmm. um, and then the novel Elric of Melnibone, which is his like origin story. Right. And then a funny story called The Stone Thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a naughty, sturdy. A story. naughty yeah, story. Yeah, it's a story. It's really funny. So, and then I would honestly just stop there. And... Uh, the stuff that I've, that list, these are all short works. Mm -hmm. So um, you they're scattered throughout this, like, six volumes that I described. Or you could just get, um, there's a Del Rey edition called The Chronicles of the Last Emperor of Melnibone. Mm -hmm. And the first one is called Elric, the Stealer of Souls, Del Rey, 2008. And Elric to Rescue Tanalorn is the next one. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that those two books will give you everything on that short list and a little more in publication oh. order. Mm -hmm. And then for Elric of Melna Benet, just pick up a used paperback used or yeah. something or the third book, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't recommend the novels. So he did this, he did all these early novellas. Mm -hmm. And then during the 80s, during the 70s and 80s, he pieced together a number of stories and rewrote them and reassembled them and created some novels. And most of them aren't very good, Oh, which is disappointing. That's disappointing, yeah. So, I mean, you could continue, you could consider yeah, reading going, but... The Sailor on the Seas of Fate. I don't really recommend it. You could consider The Sleeping Sorceress. I don't really recommend it. You could consider... The Fortress of the Pearl, I really don't recommend that one. <laughs> uh, or The Revenge of the Rose. Uh, they're just not that good. Yeah. But then quite a few years later, he wrote a trilogy of novels. These are fairly recent, called The Moonbeam Roads. Mm -hmm. And Is I'm very recent, like 20 years, 10 years? Yeah, like 10 years. Like, oh, okay. It's so like um, the 2000s. Yeah. I think. Um, so I'm reading the first one of the Moonbeam Roads novels. There's a there's an omnibus volume. It's a big fat book with three novels in it. And these are not fix-ups. They weren't no. pieced together from novellas, and they're full-length novels. Right. But he still used the exact same structure. Like, they're three parts each, and each part has seven chapters. Oh, right. Okay. So yeah. he really likes that structure, he I likes guess. It. Just feels good. Feels and good. it works pretty well. Um, the first one is called Daughter of Dreams. And this one, his style in this, he's brought Elric into like our world. Mm -hmm. And this all has to do with the multiverse stuff and parallel universes right. and all this. That um, probably feels like the 2000s because that was the yeah, thing. That was yeah. like it was in the air. Right, right. Uh, originally published as the Dream Thief's Daughter, and it has a complicated relationship to the earlier stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, so things, I had notes in my blog, all this stuff is in my blog, and I'll link to it. Um, 
things started going very magical. It's actually set uh, during the run-up to the Holocaust. Oh. Uh, with a, a character known as Von Beck, who inhabits a big old castle in Germany. And mm -hmm. it turns out is a sort of avatar of Elric in our world. Um, oh. Mm -hmm. And is actually... Uh, his Nazi superiors have. He's not a Nazi. Right? He's not a Nazi. He's not a Nazi. But um, his his uh, the the officials are trying to recruit him, right? And they're trying to pressure him because they believe that his family has both an ancient sword, which is an avatar of Stormbringer, mm -hmm. and the little thing we like to call the Holy Grail. <laughs> oh. It's like that, okay. It's like that, and it's sort of... It's a little Indiana Jones. It's a little Indiana Jones. It's sort of tied into all this um, grail lore and yeah. Nazis on the moon kind of, you know, stuff. But the first part is really quite gritty because he's, like, mm -hmm. taken to a, a detention facility and beaten and his roommate hangs himself, and it's pretty graphic. And, oh, God, that sounds awful. But then it sort of slips really gradually and smoothly into a like magical magical realism. realm so mm -hmm. uh he travels into sort of a parallel underground earth realm mm -hmm. and it's a little bit like pellucidar uh the edgar rice burroughs stories about a hollow earth right and it, it's uh it makes reference to um, Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth. And mm -hmm. it's sort of suggested that this is part of the lost continent of Mu, which right. is a whole other genre of ancient Atlantis sort of fiction. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he manages to travel into a world where he keeps seeing Elric. And mm -hmm. we sort of discover that he is... Uh, actually like a dream of of elric and then it becomes unclear for a while whether his existence whether is, he's dreaming elric or elric is dreaming, dreaming him. him and it, it becomes quite uh wait 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 does the story ever answer that question well there's from the pers it answers it from the perspective of the different characters right are the answers the same well, no, and, okay. right. but this is kind of how the multiverse works. So like it, it from one perspective, right. Elric is, is lying on a, he's unconscious in mm -hmm. his realm right. uh, in Tantalorn, and he's dreaming of traveling to find Von Beck to come and help him. Right. Von Beck then joins with him and uh, sort of wakes up as, he wakes up as Von Beck. Von Beck then has some adventures and then eventually comes back and finds Elric's like sleeping body mm -hmm. and like gives him his sword, which wakes him up. And then now the perspective shifts and he's in Elric's body, you know? Okay. So oh, it's, okay. it's okay. confusing in that way, but it's, it really is like a manifestation of this Zen, idea you know zen master wakes up and says he couldn't tell if he was a, a zen master dreaming that he was a butterfly or a butterfly now dream, dreaming that he's, he's a zen, zen master. master it is literally a manifestation of of that of kind that of logic, logic. Right? All right, right but it's um yeah so the second part kind of drifts along a little bit confusing through uh magical realms and coincidences and all right. this and i didn't find the second part that compelling because it's mm. all a lot of multiverse crap <laughs> which is pretty but not really great engaging storytelling Story. yeah that's that's what happens for me as i, yeah. I need the story to be a little more concrete yeah. and have, right and resolve yeah it picks up in the third act okay. right and now there's like we're gonna there's fight scenes again and stuff happening and mm -hmm. you know so and we're back with but it's it's interesting to see elric through the lens of a human character from our own world mm -hmm. and that's because we've spent 
I've spent a, a lot of now. long time reading about Elric as the protagonist, describing everything from his perspective. Like, what would it would it be like to to meet Elric? You know, right? And he's pretty terrifying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> from a and so you know, and Stormbringer is pretty terrifying from a human perspective. Right. And it's cool to see that. Mm-hmm. But I want to talk briefly about. Um, the nature of inspiration and sort of the way an artist's career might function. And then I think we'll wind up for today because yeah. everyone will be ready to, to doze off. So, oh, um, yeah, nature of inspiration and early work versus late work. Mm-hmm. So I've come to think of the early Elric stories written by a very young Moorcock as like genuinely inspired work. Yeah. Um, written Nabokov used to say there's only one way to write and that's ecstatically like just in a rush of Mm -hmm. inspiration Um, he was written under the influence of the genre and the language and Nabokov was too but Mm -hmm. um, and that's one way to write great work and like a blast of youthful energy and inspiration Um, but it's not the only way right Uh, one can also revise a great work into existence that can happen. Mm-hmm. Outlining it and drafting it and diligently working on it and reworking until it's really polished and, and good. And it might not have as, as much of the raw exuberance uh, as the first kind of work, but it can still be very, very satisfying, if not more satisfying. And I think right. like a, a novel like, like Middle March, you know, was written that way, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Over a long period of time, carefully yeah. worked out carefully and planned, revised. Carefully planned, executed, revised, right. What doesn't seem to work well is writing, trying to write in a hot blast of inspiration after the inspiration has left. <laughs> but there is no inspiration. Yeah. Just so, you know, going on steam. Moorcock's mid-career, uh, and he had a mid-career that lasted for decades. <laughs> um, he was also a very successful editor, I should mention. Too. Oh, right. He was, but yeah, we're talking job. about his fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, sort of fell into this hole. Um he wrote these works quickly for money, and the inspiration that used to let him write so quickly tended to peter out. And um, he would he would brag about it and write articles about how he could write and finish a novel in three days, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, that you know you need to have an outline and you need to have some some ideas and some tropes you're going to go to and then you need a lot of coffee and a lot of whiskey or something like that yeah. <laughs> and so an awful lot of his novels aren't that good oh yeah because he didn't really have time to revise them into polish and he wasn't really inspired to do this like this blast of of youthful, youthful inspiration. energy inspiration yeah and i related this in my blog to phil dick because i don't think phil dick ever really developed a late style right where he would kind of write an outline right come up with a structure and kind of carve this thing out right. of wood right for whatever reasons and i've read some biographies of him uh from drugs to mental illness to physical illness uh Dick continued to work like he did when he was very young. He wrote in binges, even when the ideas actually demanded more serious and sustained treatment. Mm -hmm. And some of his greatest works, like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, they're kind of hot messes. Yeah. Because he didn't revise things into coherence. Right. But they're stuffed with so many brilliant ideas. Ideas. People can't put it down. That you can't put it down. But they're riddled But it riddled doesn't actually with, make a lot of sense. No, they're riddled with inconsistent timelines, internal inconsistencies right. and whatnot. Um, in the case of androids, this actually makes the, the work feel more hallucinatory. Because you question, you, as you're reading it, right. and like the timeline changes and the facts change and whatnot, and you can't establish like what really happened when, you start to question whether you're fully... <laughs> Am I reading this right? Or whether yeah. your brain is betraying you or something. Right. But uh, I do have no doubt that if Dick had developed like a really diligent, regular approach to writing, he could have revised androids right. into something that was razor sharp, you know, that yeah. was 
something really well not that it's not compelling yeah but something really amazing yeah yeah daughter of dreams is in what i would call more cox late style Mm -hmm. um he deliberately and consciously attempted to bring his oeuvre into a single intricate pattern. So he's been applying this multiverse concept to all his old works. And this includes going back and changing characters. Like, oh, hey. like, oh, this character, I'm giving him a new name and he's actually an avatar of the eternal champion rather than like right. changing events, con- making all these connections between his old books. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a little, what's his name? <sighs> You know, he screwed up the Star Wars thing. Oh, yeah. With the whole retconning. You know? I'm not... It's a little George like Lucas, Lucas, yeah. Lucas, yeah. I was going to say Spielberg, no, Lucas. Uh, no, I'm not really happy about that. Yeah. And a lot of that stuff does not entice me to want to read a lot of his sort of mid-catalog novels. Mm-hmm. Right. You yeah. know, I don't think it's really worthwhile. I don't think readers... I think he's indulging himself. In other words, yes. I don't think readers were begging him, please make this all into one giant ball of yarn wouldn't that be great i don't think it's really no. great um, no one's no one's jonesing for it but uh anyway this despite that because this is written in his late style and it is inspired by his early work and mm-hmm. his character it's pretty good and so i'm going to yeah. recommend that people can read would read daughter of dreams so you would read all the early work you would basically skip over i call it kind of the whole like mid the career uh elric stuff unless yeah. you really want to you just want your yeah. completest you gotta read it all yeah but read it in publication order and not internal chronology order right. so don't get the golanx books as nice as they are as nice as they are as pretty as set it is because if you do that You'll have to be con- you'll have to like print out a list and be jumping Coming around. Back and forth and it's, it'll be stupid. It's hard, and, and if you do read them in chronological, like internal chronology order, it's not that fun. It's confusing, and right. you're immediately turned off by some of the mid, like career Mid-career novels work, right. that are bad and Which boring, bad. and mm-hmm. it, so you'll immediately rather than being like racing through all those early novellas that are really tight and really inspiring you'll be immediately bogged down in right. mediocre storytelling. Right, and be turned off to the whole thing. Yeah. So at least that's that's my conclusion. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a... Edward Said had a book called On Late Style. Mm-hmm. And this is a quote from uh, Edward Rothstein writing in the New York Review of Books in 2006. Mm-hmm. What artist does not yearn someday to possess a late style? A late style would reflect a life of learning, the wisdom that comes with experience, the sadness that comes from wisdom and a mastery of craft that has nothing left to prove. Right. It might recapitulate a life's themes, reflect on questions answered, and allude to others beyond understanding. But even if that kind of culminating style is not granted to an artist, observers want to discern it. We want to be reassured that there really is something progressive about human understanding. Hmm. Hmm. So, yes, we want to believe that there's an arc there's to arc. Moorcock's career. We're getting somewhere. And I, I think there is. Uh, I think of, you know, it's, it's oh, you, not You've established hidden, it, yeah. It's right. Right. Yeah. Um, but we all would like to have an arc, you know. Right. <laughs> I, well, yeah, yeah. I keep writing and I keep hoping that I'm getting somewhere with this. Well, you know, you start to make improvements. And that there will be a discernible arc to it, you know. At some point mm-hmm. when I'm gone, if someone wants to page through and page through, through and make sense of it, all this there will be i'll have a late style there will be an arc mm-hmm. you know and so the, i guess that's sort of what i'm trying to do now is find that and then of course just also figure out what am i writing am i writing fiction autobiography non-fiction criticism <laughs> essays or what all the above, <laughs> all the above. question anyway that's my recommendation for dealing with the Elric stories. I'm not even quite done with Daughter of Dreams, but I'm going to go ahead and recommend it. But I really do recommend that people read, uh, if, you, if you're if you at all interested in this kind of fantasy, uh, 
go ahead and read the old stuff first and read it in the the order that I've outlined and then consider mm-hmm. reading the the new the the new trilogy. The trilogy. Yeah. And I can't honestly I can't at least um Daughter of Dreams I can't vouch for the second and third one. I think they kind of crawl up their own butts a little bit. Oh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> but um okay. I think we're there. I think we're there. Yeah. We were not bursting with inspiration ourselves, but rather just trying to uh, show up, crank out a novel in three days, armed with whiskey and caffeine. <laughs> There's no whiskey or caffeine involved, to be honest. No, there wasn't. But we wanted to show up. We wanted to show up, so here we are. You've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com, where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye-bye. Bye.